I've been doing this whole pastor thing for long enough now to watch people who have been an integral part of the congregation, people that I've worked with, people that I know, people who I would consider to be more than just acquaintances. I have been here long enough and, and done this long enough to watch some of these people walk away from their faith community. And it's not that they're going anywhere else, and it's not that they had a bad experience, it's just that, well, they're done. It doesn't do it for them anymore. There just isn't the value in being a part of a faith community. And honestly, that makes me sad. I don't take it personally. Rather, it makes me sad because I still think that faith communities following in the way of Jesus can address some of the greatest challenges right now and can, and can provide hope, wholeness, and well-being. And if you want to know what that looks like, well, our focus text today is where it's at. It is a powerful story that when practiced in a faith community can shape your life in powerful ways. My name is Chad Peterson. I serve as the lead pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, and it is great that you're joining us. And I hope that this online worship and devotion time is good for your soul. We begin our time together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some stories just need to be told because they are so good. Some stories need to be heard because they can change your life. The story of Philip and the eunuch is both, but the interesting, interesting thing is that this story never should have been told. So you have to get in the right mindset to really hear this story. You need to imagine that you are somewhere else right now. I'll help you get there. You need to go to a remote location on a road that travels through nowhere. It's a place you pass through, not your destination. Are you there? Can you see this? Can you imagine it? All right, now stay right there. Now the main character in this story is named Philip. He is a natural leader, a gifted speaker. He has charisma and presence. Y you know what I mean when I say that, right? He can walk into a space and work it. He can work the crowd. He can own it. He, he can talk with you for 10 minutes and win you over. He makes friends so easily. And none of this feels forced. It's all very natural. Do you know how hard it is to pull that off? <laughs> Philip does what, well, I do. He's fascinated and compelled by Jesus' teachings and way of life. And he shares that with others. He's a preacher, a pastor, a church leader. But the big difference between Philip and I is that he is wildly successful. <laughs> I, he is so much better than I am, better than I could ever hope to be. Philip has had early success in his career. The time that he spent in Samaria, which is, well, honestly, not that great a place to be. In the time that he was there, he was able to gain a large following. The way that he would talk about, the way that we would talk about it today is that Philip developed a mega church in a small town south of Jerusalem. That's just incredible. And you know what happens to people who are this good, right? They don't stay in small towns long. No, they expand and move into larger cities. If you are on a board of directors, these are the people you want in key leadership positions because, well, they can do great things. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go, toward, and go toward the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the, of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was, and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, 
Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Astus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. But this is where the story gets a little weird. Philip isn't told to go work his magic in Jerusalem, a large city, to build up the church there. No, no, he is told to go to the place where you are right now. Do you remember where you are? The place that I asked you to stay? That road in the middle of nowhere with nothing around it? It is a ridiculous place for a religious superstar to be. But on this unnamed, unmapped rural road running to who knows where, Philip encounters a single traveler, a foreigner, an official, a eunuch, and a religious seeker who has just made a pilgrimage to worship God and is now headed home. The second character in our story. There we go. So seeing him, Philip asks for a ride. And while they're sitting together, they talk and Philip can't help it. He does whatever he does. And for whatever reason, this Ethiopian is moved and changed by Philip's words. The Ethiopian has been seeking God and has now encountered the essence of God in the way of Jesus as Philip has described and he wants to be a part of this new religious community, not later, but right now. It is that important to him. So he sees water out the window, demands that the driver stop, and then asks Philip the most important question of this story. What is to prevent me from being baptized? In other words, what is to prevent me from being a part of the community of faith? And the short answer to the question being asked? Absolutely everything. Jesus was Jewish. He was raised by Jewish parents. He lived in a Jewish town. He was a Jewish rabbi who interpreted the Jewish scriptures. He had Jewish followers and participated in Jewish festivals. Jesus' followers believed that he was the Jewish Messiah. The very early church, those who eventually would be called Christians, began as a Jewish religious movement. And as Jews, Jesus' followers were steeped in their religious tradition. God had given their ancestors the Torah, the teachings that they were to obey in order to set themselves apart as God's chosen people. Gentiles or non-Jews who did not follow the dietary, ethical, and other commandments of God could not possibly be a part of the worshiping community. For that matter, neither could those who were considered incomplete or tainted. Individuals, for example, eunuchs. So, does everybody know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is a castrated male, or a male that lacks the sexual function to produce offspring. So one could become a eunuch either by accident or by intention. Either way, eunuchs were outside the boundary. They were not completely men, nor, will they, nor were they women. They were sexually ambiguous, and, and as such, in the law of Deuteronomy, they were forbidden from membership in Jewish worshiping communities. <laughs> So back to, to the story. Philip is sitting beside a Gentile eunuch who has just asked to be a part of the worshiping community of those who follow Jesus. Think about this. Years of, of traditional Jewish teaching have taught Philip the answer to the eunuch's question. It is a no-brainer. But Jesus, the one who ate with the outcasts and, and touched the untouchables and loved the unlovables and healed the Gentiles, has helped Philip see something different. So here's the question for you today. What do you do 
when your religion isn't big enough for God? <laughs> what do you do when your rules and codes and laws and traditions keep others out who Jesus invited in? What do you do when your system falls apart because the new thing that God is doing is more compelling? For Philip, what you do is you stop the car, you get out, and you baptize the eunuch. If you've been a part of the Bethlehem community for a while, you know that at the very beginning of all of our services, whether that's you know in person or online, we say almost the same thing every week, that you're welcome as you are for who you are. And, and while that is really easy to say, it's really hard to do. It's actually one of the more controversial things that we can proclaim. The story of Philip and the eunuch is crazy. In a world where ideology, religion, race, and politics serve as tests for who should be invited into the community. This story makes me think to myself, do I mean what I say? And I think as a congregation, the story should make us think together, do we mean what we say? Is that how we want to be known? Because honestly, I have to tell you, this is not how the world works. This has never been how the world works. Uh, there's always scapegoats and people that, that we view as not one of us. So for, for me to say that I don't discriminate, well, that's just a lie. I make assumptions all the time about people I know nothing about. The biblical story then has the power to change our lives and the world because it directly confronts and challenges our own narratives, our own thoughts, our own assumptions that we make. And sometimes we want to blunt the biblical story to make things a little bit easier, to make these stories a little less sharp because they expose us and they make us vulnerable. The eunuch says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The refugee says, what is to prevent me from moving into your neighborhood? The high school student coming to terms with a sexuality says, what is to prevent me from coming out to my family and friends? The average everyday person says, what is to prevent me from being myself around others? And the answer to all of these questions is the same. Everything. I mean, what is to prevent me well, how about ridicule and shame and violence and intolerance and unacceptance, worried about what other people will say to us? I mean, the Christian story, the way of Jesus, the kingdom of God speaks a countercultural message. What should prevent me? Well, the answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because that is the nature of God's love. If this is not what it means to be church, I guess then I don't know what is. If our worship is not about gathering to practice seeing ourselves, our neighbors, our community, and the world through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of compassion, understanding, and love, then I don't know what worship is about or why anybody would come. When I ask people, like I'm doing you know, today, like I do every day, to support Bethlehem with their time, their leadership, their finances. What I want people to support is not an institution or a program or a club, but a community that practices what the world should be like in God's reign. A community that resists traditional loyalties to state, party, culture, or family in an act of loyalty to a group that transcends all traditional categories. A community where your life is not measured according to any other purpose or goal than to discover your humanity. A community that welcomes Ethiopian eunuchs. <laughs> In the, in, the, in the Acts story, God is up to something new. Because of the risen Lord, everything has changed. No one can be permitted to treat another as if God cares nothing for him or her. Our churches must reflect this. It must embrace this because it is, the, it is part of the good news of Jesus. It is the good news that for us. And it's hard news for us. So today, sit with this, reflect on it, be challenged by it, be changed by it, that you might find the fullness of life that God is calling you to live today. This is the good news we hear. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.
as a way of taking the focus text today and the reflection on that text just a little bit deeper and applying it more directly to your life, here are a couple of reflection questions for you to discuss with someone else, journal about, or simply ponder. Question number one, who do you discriminate against? Don't say no one. I mean, what assumptions do you make about people based on where they are from, what they look like, what car they drive, what bumper stickers they display, etc.? Just spend some time thinking about that. And question number two, uh, what things do you hide from others for fear of feeling shame or not being accepted? If today's message is important to you, then please feel free to share this with others. Give it a like or leave a comment. Bethlehem's ministry is sustained through your generous support. Thank you for making what we do possible. Making time for intentional prayer is an important part of our faith practice. If you have a prayer request you wish to share with our community, please leave a public comment, send us a private message, or contact the church office. Each week our staff and our congregation pray for those who have been named to us. And now we join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we do give you thanks for the many blessings in our life, for our family, for our friends, who people, for the people who love us more than we will ever know. Gracious God, we ask that you continue to move us deeper into our faith, that you would help us to see the other as your beloved child. Gracious God, open us up to new possibilities and new ways of seeing this world. Today we pray for all those people who are in need in their bodies, minds, and spirits. We pray for those who are sick, who are in need of healing. We pray for the people who are known only to you, we pray for those who are known to us, our family, and our friends. And we pray to the people, for the people that have been made known to us in our community. We lift up before you today Rosemary Benson, Mary Jo Bunin, Betty Eastman, Anne Frobenius, Bill Gavin, Elaine Gerke, Elizabeth Munt, Kathy Nelson, Gaylord Olson, Vera Peterson, Jerry Shechem, Barb Cyrils, Mimi Swanson, and Brett Peppernow. Gracious God, we ask that these individuals find healing even if they cannot be cured. Gracious God, we continue to ask that you walk with us in all times of life. We give you thanks that you do not abandon us. Even when we cannot see you or sense you, you are with us. We pray all this and whatever else you see that we need in your Son's name who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, as you go from where you are to re-engage with your community, take God's blessing with you that you might be a blessing to somebody else as you encounter them this week. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.